All right, it's wonderful to have you all back in here, and I hope you've enjoyed your lunch. Before I say anything else, I neglected to do this yesterday. I don't want to forget today. I want to thank all of the wait staff from Unite Here Local One. <laughs> yesterday, uh, you might recall I mentioned, or maybe I admitted, that I had been involved in labor management relations for four decades. During this time, I've seen many great labor leaders come and go. There is one extraordinary leader who throughout my career has been a constant voice for working families and an economy that works for everyone, and that's Richard Trumka. Richard's... Yeah. Rich is a coal miner and a lawyer. He put him th himself through college and law school working in the mines. In 1982, at the age of 33, he was elected as the youngest president ever of the United Mine Workers of America. Rich and I are just about the same age, but in 1982, I was just a baby lawyer starting at the Machinist Union. You were already leading one of the most storied unions in our nation's history and holding a now infamous company by the name of Pittston, accountable for the health, the safety, and the retirement security of its employees. Hats off to you, Rich, for that. In 1995, still a young man, he became the secretary treasurer of the AFL-CIO, the largest organization of labor unions in the country. And in 2009, Rich took the helm of the 12.5 million member labor federation. Ever since then, workers across the nation and around the world have depended on his leadership. In the past year, he has been the leading voice of the movement to create an economy that is fair for everyone and to shape the national debate around wage stagnation and income inequality. He is also the cheerleader for U.S. manufacturing and business growth. He knows that when business wins, workers win. Please join me in welcoming a fierce advocate for the middle class, a tireless fighter for work workplaces that work and one of the most passionate and gifted speakers you will ever hear. And wait, one more thing, a brand new grandfather with a two-week-old grandson. I have uh, 150 pictures of my grandson that I <laughs> thought I'd do on the slideshow for everyone. Uh, thank you, Allison, for that uh, really overly kind uh, and generous introduction. Uh, and I just want to tell you how much I appreciate your leadership uh, and your friendship. Uh, I'm truly honored to be here today for this very, very important discussion. And I look forward to having a real dialogue about the future of collective bargaining. Uh, to my sisters and brothers here from labor, uh, it is always, and I mean always, good to see you. I thank you for the work that you're doing each and every day to make life better for working people. And let me tell you something, our job has never been more important than it is today. So God bless you for all that you do. To my friends here for management, I want to commend you. Uh, for being willing to listen to our concerns, to meet us halfway, and to build an economy that is good for business and good for workers. And finally, to the mediators in the room, including Allison, uh, I'd say this, um, thank you. Thank you for your service. You're the guardians of collective bargaining, uh, your professionalism and objectivity are second to none, and we as a nation are all better off because of what you do. Thank you.
Now, I believe that this room is probably evenly divided between labor management and, and neutrals, and let me say, we may have different roles, but we share common goals. See, each of us wants American companies to succeed. Each of us want workers to be safe, satisfied, and productive. Each of us wants to avoid work stoppages, and because we can't live too long without a paycheck, and a, a business can't live very long without workers either. When business and labor don't get along, entire communities suffer. And yet, we can't just go along to get along. Uh, the labor movement refuses to allow working families and our communities, and yes, our businesses, continue to suffer a slow and painful death as more and more and more Amer of America's assets become concentrated in fewer and fewer hands. See, the economy is out of balance. It's wrong, and it has to stop. And collective bargaining. Collective bargaining is the most powerful tool for bringing our economy back into balance. At the AFL-CIO, we are experimenting with new forms of collective bargaining, and we're reinvigorating what's tried and true. But we don't own the idea of collective bargaining or the concept of a strong and growing middle class. See, that's for all of us. We all own it. In that sense, the future of collective bargaining is in our hands. And it will take all of us to preserve it, strengthen it, and expand it. See, it's critical that we continue to have conversations like this and the conversations that take place in the hall and in the evenings. You know, as some of you know, I'm a, I'm a third generation coal miner from a, a small town in Pennsylvania. And I was taught the importance of collective bargaining from a, a very, very, very early age. We weren't rich, but my dad's union job put food on the table, a roof over our heads, and it made the mine safer. Now, we had the dignity of work and the confidence that the next generation would do better than the last generation. See, that's what the American dream is all about. Today, that dream has slipped out of reach for far too many families. Wages are stubbornly flat. Income inequality has reached levels that shock the conscience. 63% of Americans say they don't have enough savings to cover a $500 car repair or a $1,000 medical bill. A majority of workers are living paycheck to paycheck, and for the first time in our nation's history, our children may inherit a lower standard of living. You see, that is the issue of our time. Pope Francis has said it. I said it. President Obama has said it. Many people have said it. We're suffering a moral and economic crisis. The policies that have left workers weaker and poorer, and the elected politicians who wrote those rules, uh, have not been held to account. And as a result, a growing number of Americans are both angry and anxious. And quite frankly, who can blame them? They work hard. They pay taxes, they do right by their families and communities, and yet they feel their future slipping away. This anger is manifest in the 2016 election, uh, in the rise of a democratic socialist and also a dangerous demagogue. You know, this much is clear. People are fed up with going along to get along. 
We're tired of the Wall Street and Washington elite writing the rules for themselves. And we're ready to use our voice and our vote to make big changes, to rewrite the rules of the economy. See, we've already begun to use our voice. This year, working people have led the national debate. We put the focus on good jobs with strong and growing wages. We've made clear that workers should be sharing in the wealth that we create. We've called for a, an end to the tax and trade policies that outsources our jobs and widens the gap between the rich and the rest of us. But we also know that the single most effective tool for building an economy of shared prosperity is collective bargaining. When workers sit down across the table from our employers and we bargain, we bring home higher wages, a greater access to health care and a pension, and are more likely to be safe on the job. But most importantly, workers who bargain collectively have a voice, a say in the terms and conditions of work. And when we raise the bar for ourselves, we raise the bar for everyone. Because other employers raise pay and improve benefits to attract and keep the best people. Now, when I was first elected office uh, in my union, the United Mine Workers, I was elected to the safety committee. So my first real personal experience with collective bargaining centered on the life and death realities of coal mining work. And being at the table changes you. You know, it gives you a, a greater appreciation of how difficult it is to achieve even minimal progress. And it shows you how contract language plays out in reality. You know, a rule about mine safety is more than just a bunch of words on a page. It means the difference between not coming home and a father or a mother returning home to his or her family. The same truth applies today. When we negotiate an extra personal day, it means someone can spend more time with a loved one. When we protect our pensions, it means a, a senior can retire with dignity and security. When we win fair scheduling language, it means a, a, a working mom can balance family and career. You see, that's the power and the beauty of collective bargaining. You know, as president of the UMWA, I had the privilege of being involved in all facets of collective bargaining. I traveled to New Mexico and Arizona to bargain alongside locals that were mostly Navajo. I went to Montana and Missouri and Illinois and I crisscrossed all of Appalachia. And at each stop, I had one simple purpose. And that was to win the best wages and benefits and then keep up our end of the bargain which is to be the hardest working, best trained, most productive workforce that the world has ever seen. To me, that's the essence of labor management cooperation because we share the same basic concerns. In many ways, we're like a railroad. Labor is one track, management is the other but we're both heading in the same direction. And if one track isn't on firm footing, or we start to diverge and get too wide, the train derails, and we have big problems. Now, I know this conference has and will continue to highlight a number of successful partnerships. Ford and the UAW, American Water, 
and the utility workers, uh, and even the Labor Management Cooperation Committee right here in Chicago that had successfully held down health care premiums for city employees. The key stakeholders in these relationships, well, they can tell you better than anyone else what works and also what doesn't work. My view is this. There has to be an open line of communications, not just during negotiations. And each side must demonstrate a willingness to have hard conversations in a respectful way and then look for a way to find common ground. It's built on trust. It's built on belief. It's built on the basis of having one set of facts, not my facts and your facts. Now, listen, there are some in management who think that negotiating with employees is really beneath them. It's giving away the store, that I have to talk to these people. This is my place. See, they, they bring a dismissive and often a hostile attitude to the bargaining table. And then there's some on the union side who think it's not the job uh, of workers to make their employers profitable. And that anything gained without a fight doesn't constitute a win. Well, I disagree with both of those perspectives. See, I tell my friends all the time that an unprofitable company does us no good. When employers go out of business, we pay the price. When they design a bad product, we pay the price. When they don't capitalize a facility, we pay a price. So we have a responsibility to help our employers succeed. But we also have the freedom to bargain for a share of that success. See, we want an equitable piece of the profits that we help create. And that's the flip side of shared sacrifice that we face in hard times. Because many times, again and again and again, we've done our share of sacrificing. Now we also want to share prosperity in the good times. See, this is where the critical work of FMCS comes in, helping labor and management bridge the gap. In general, mediators don't like to talk about themselves. It's really not in their nature. Uh, so I want to spend just a moment or two giving my perspective on the job that they do. See, from the moment FMCS receives notice of an expiring contract, mediators swing into action. They contact the parties, they offer their services, they probe for middle ground, and then they design a process that can work. Mediation can go on for weeks and weeks at a time in hotel conference rooms and stale rooms that get nasty after a while. <laughs> they happen in factory basements. They happen all over the place. But day and night, these public servants do everything they can to encourage cooperation, to improve communications, and to preserve labor peace. And on behalf of the 12 and a half million working women and men of the AFL-CIO, to each and every one of you, I just want to say thank you for everything that you do and the spirit that you do it with every single day. Thank you. And I just want to say this to, to my colleagues in, in labor and management. Sometimes we think bringing in a mediator is a sign of weakness or a sign of failing. It's not. It's a sign of strength. 
It's the sign that you really are serious about wanting to get in an agreement and you want all the help you can because none of us have a monopoly on right answers. Don't look at bringing a mediator in as somehow saying, I can't do it. Bringing a mediator in can help you do it better, can help you come to a better agreement quicker, faster, more cooperatively, and then set up a relationship afterwards as well. One of the most challenging labor disputes to come before the FMCS was the Verizon strike. Now, I won't pretend that I was somehow objective uh, in that case, because <laughs> I marched the picket lines uh, with CWA and IBEW members uh, who were fighting for better life, and I did find the company's initial offer to be wholly inadequate. But I wanted a resolution as much as anyone. And Allison was sent in to mediate the conflict. Uh, and Labor Secretary Tom Perez joined her, uh, which shows you the incredible magnitude uh, of that particular work stoppage. And in the end, the sides reached a new agreement with substantial raises and enhanced job security. And not only that, they agreed to set up committees focused on improving their relationship. Friends, let me tell you something. If labor and Verizon can find a way to come together, anything is possible <laughs> in the good old US of A. <laughs> you know, a reporter at the Business Week recently asked me, should there be more strikes in the United States? I certainly hope not. You know, our goal is to have employers sit down with workers and bargain in good faith. But when you have companies that instead of treating us as assets to be invested in, uh, they treat us as costs to be cut, there's going to be conflict. And by the way, our system is unfortunately designed for conflict. You petition the National Labor Relations Board to form a new union, and the first thing that happens in many cases is employers start threatening or firing people illegally and threatening to outsource our jobs, and they start ripping each other apart. Now think about this. You went out on your first date with someone, and on the first date, the person you went out with says, you're an idiot, you're a thief, you have no redeeming value whatsoever, I'm telling you. Do you think there'd be a second date? <laughs> Seriously? You couldn't wait to get out of the room, right? Well, that's what US labor relations does. It makes you fight. It's corrosive. But it doesn't have to be that way. In most other countries, it isn't that way. So to strengthen collective bargaining, we also need to fix organizing. So common sense tells us it's virtually impossible to be enemies during the unionization process and then turn around and say, I was just kidding, let's be partners at the bargaining process. You know, that's why the AFL-CIO is working so hard to pass the Wage Act legislation, which would dramatically increase fines against those who break the law. Now, it isn't about punishing anyone. It's about ensuring a fair process and incentivizing employers and employees alike to cooperate from the outset. Earlier this month, after a, a majority of Zara employees in New York City signed cards indicating their desire to be represented by the retail, wholesale, and department union, uh, store union, the company agreed. And that kind of attitude can help set a positive tone as the sides head to their first contract negotiations. So there's a, a lot of discussion right now about what the future of collective bargaining will look like. There were those on the left who suggest, wrongly, that the current model will cease to exist. There were those on the right who are trying to legislate collective bar bargaining out of existence. 
Well, I see a different path forward. I believe we're in the early stages of a worker-led resurgence where collective bargaining and collective action are at the forefront of labor relations. Millennials, who now outnumber baby boomers, overwhelmingly support unions. More and more working people are embracing the power and possibility of banding together for a better life. The emergence of the digital economy has created a, a new urgency about how best for working people to use our voices collectively on the job. And leaders across the political spectrum are feeling the groundswell of a nation that has reached its tipping point. See, America needs collective bargaining. We need it to help businesses grow, workers succeed, communities thrive. We need it to create a level playing field, a fairer economy, and a stronger country. Labor, <laughs> labor and management working together, communicating and compromising, sacrificing and listening, reaching common ground, using common sense, benefiting the common good. That's the future uh, at work. And if we stumble, FMCS will be there to get us back on the right track. God bless you, have a great day. Thank you, Rich. That was wonderful. That's the first standing ovation of the conference. <laughs> they were tired of sitting, I think. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so we are so grateful for your inspirational remarks and your exceedingly kind words about the service. I would like to ask you if I can take the privilege of a moment here to follow what I understand to be a tradition that was begun um, probably the very first labor management conference held by FMCS more than 30 years ago. Um, we would like to ask our most senior mediator to stand and be recognized. That would be Jim Statham. Where are you, Jim? And we'd like our newest mediator to stand and be recognized. Uh, and that would be Myla Height, who began working for the service two weeks ago. And Jim has 42 years. Okay, and while I'm at it, could I ask all our mediators to stand so all of you in the audience know to go look for them and talk to them and make sure you hear about all of our great training programs. Stand up. <laughs> All right, now, one more thing. All of our managers, national office field, and our fabulous staff who has made this conference possible, please stand and be recognized. Okay, thank you for that moment uh, of, uh, of personal privilege. So, Rich, you talked a lot about being in the early stages of a worker-led resurgence where collective bargaining and collective action are at the forefront of labor relations. You also said that the AFL-CIO is experimenting with new forms of collective bargaining. Can you tell me more about that? Sure. Uh, th there's a lot of talk right now about the, the gig economy, and, and I, you know, I say two things about the gig economy, first of all. First, it's very, very tiny. Uh, second of all, it's not new. <laughs> I mean, uh, think about this. Musicians, actors, construction workers, they've all been doing the gig economy for years and years and years and years, and we've made collective bargaining work. Now, there were nuances to it uh, that we're working with, and so uh, the machinist, uh, your old union, 
uh, just organized Uber workers in New York City. Uh, we have uh, taxi cab drivers, different places. We have daycare workers uh, that we are organizing with, trying to pass legislation in a, in a county-wide area so that we can bargain with the county so that those workers who work for a different employer every day are taken care of and there's standards of health and safety that they can live by. Uh, and you have car wash workers uh, that are out there. Uh, we're trying everything that works and particularly with young people. Uh, you know, it used to be with young people, we would go to them and say, here's what we stand for, here's what we are, come join us. And they would say, you know, you guys are nice people, and you got a great organization there, but you know, this doesn't quite work for me. And we said, yeah, we know, but come and join us anyway. Come on, you know, get with the, get with the program here. Well, now we're doing things a lot differently. We're, uh, led by our secretary treasurer, Liz Schuller, uh, we've been reaching out for about uh, six years now to young workers, going to them and saying, tell us what you need us to be. And we will try to make ourselves to be that to meet your needs. That's what we've done with Uber workers. That's what we've done with daycare workers. We've said, tell us what you need so that we can meet your needs. Uh, and then, you know, we've done a lot of different things. The Taxi Workers Alliance in New York City are negotiating for, quote, independent contractors uh, that are about as independent as I am, uh, quite frankly. You know, so. Uh, it, it's a trial and error thing. When it works, we stay with it. When it doesn't, we move it aside. But most of our ideas are coming from the bottom up as opposed to the top down, uh, which makes a whole lot of difference. Uh, millennials are actually very, very fun to, to work with. We are, uh, we are enjoying that as well. Um, and I'm, we've been thrilled to be working with Secretary Treasurer Schuler. Uh, with the Young Workers Program and trying to find ways that we can help deliver what they need uh, and really focusing our attention on this next generation of workers. Now, speaking about millennials, you pointed out that they now outnumber baby boomers. Um, I said yesterday, uh, in four years, there'll be more than half of the workplace. Um, what do you think is the greatest challenge for unions dealing with this generational shift and you and I both come out of old unions that, you know, seniority is everything. Um, what are some of the things the AFL is doing to help unions, you know, sort of surmount these challenges and bring the millennials in? The, the first thing is talking to millennials. Uh, in, instead of talking to ourselves and saying, we now have all the answers that we will pronounce to you, uh, we go to the millennials and we start talking to them. And, and I, we found out there are some major differences uh, with millennials. And I, I think it's, they get a bad rap when people try to say, oh, they're, they think they're entitled to everything. I don't think it's that at all. Uh, I, I think what millennials look at is they see work as a greater extension of themselves than perhaps uh, our generation or the generations before that. And as a result, they want to be more involved in the process. And they want to know. Things. I, when I went to the mine, somebody said, do this. I didn't say, how was that decision made? Uh, and, and why should I do that? You know, I did it. But millennials really do want to know how the decision was made and, and why. And not necessarily because they think they know better, but it's just the way they process things and it enables them to then integrate their work in a, in a better way and, and communicate more effectively. So it takes a lot more transparency. It takes a, a, a lot more, uh, a, a different process. And it really takes the notion away, the, the paternalistic approach that so many people, uh, once they go up the ladder, sort of think they're entitled to have. I said it, therefore you do it. Uh, it's actually more about process and so, Paying attention to the process uh, is very, very important with millennials. And then I, I think we also have to figure out ways to, to integrate uh, more and more young people. You know, I was 32 when I got elected president of mine workers. You know, I looked for the manual in the desk. I couldn't find it anywhere. Uh, so I started calling people, you know, friends to ask me about that. But 
I, I could do that because union democracy allowed me to break into that, into the leadership. I ran against uh, an entrenched incumbent and I beat him. But that's not the case at 99.9% .9 of the workplaces. There isn't that way to break into it. So you have to make accommodations uh, and figure out a good mix uh, of leadership from all different branches of the organization. Quite frankly, when you think about that in the long run, it's best so that there's always seasoned leaders that are there and that are coming along, and it gives people an opportunity uh, to, to feel more appreciated. Because they, 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 they feel appreciated not just that way. And I think, you know, money sometimes helps uh, them to feel appreciated as well. But, but that's not the be all and end all. It's actually feeling part of the organization, respected and appreciated by the organization. And, you know, for, for some in, in our generation, that's stuff that we didn't put a high enough premium on for a lot of years. So uh, what do you think is going to be the difference at the bargaining table when you have millennials on both sides? You think bargaining is going to change? I, I think bargaining changes all the time. And I don't think there's one pat way of bargaining. I think everybody has their own style. I think it'll be more fact-based, more problem-solving, which I think is good. Because I, I find millennials to be generally solution-driven. They're looking for a way to solve a problem, uh, and they work towards that. And that's what collective bargaining should be about, uh, mutually trying to solve problems that you have or make things better uh, where you are. Uh, and so I, I think it'll probably be more fact-based and a little more solution-driven. I think you'll see uh, less of the nonsense. Uh, I think they'll have less tolerance for bad faith bargaining. I mean, we all been to the bargaining table. You sit down at the bargaining table in 10 minutes, you know if the person across from you is serious about getting an agreement or you're there to limp, you know, mouth empty words back and forth and kill some time so they can say to the NLRB, Oh, look, I met 47 times. We never discussed any issues, but that's all right. We met 47 times. You know, so I, I think they'll have less tolerance for that on both sides of the table. <laughs> That'll be nice for us. Yeah, it'd be nice <laughs> for all of us. <laughs> so you mentioned um, uh, the, the gig economy not really being so new. And in fact, we had a panel this morning led by Susan Davis from, uh, from New York. Um, and Bernie Plum, uh, also a management lawyer and a union lawyer, about the uh, lessons from the original gig economy. And they talked a lot about the fact that, you know, for many years, uh, artists and musicians and stagehands and actors have been working gigs. And they've had collective bargaining and they've had benefits. So what do you think labor ought to be doing about this new gig economy that, as you say, in the numbers may not be big yet, but we're seeing a lot of new platforms uh, by which work is getting done. So what do you think labor should be doing to uh, support them? Well, first of all, be flexible uh, and understand that there are a number of platforms and start understanding the platforms. Don't go in thinking you know everything about the platform. Find out about the platform from the people who are on the platform, uh, point number one. Point number two, find out what their needs are. You know, if they need uh, for you to provide health care, figure out a mechanism to give them health care because they work for five or six different employers and you're trying to give them uh, an employer-based plan that they'll never qualify for, it's not going to work. So be flexible, uh, be open, and do your homework and find out about uh, the platform and then you can make things work. Uh, I've never seen uh, a problem yet that you couldn't make work if the people were one. Uh, open, honest, and, and really in problem-solving mold. You know, we do it better in this country than anybody. We solve problems. We make things better. Uh, we help employers go forward. Employers help workers have a better life. I mean, we built the middle class together. And so more of that, just being more flexible and being willing to listen and look uh, rather than make pronouncements uh, all the time. So to that point, as mediators, we often find that um, despite the value we've been hearing for the last two days about uh, working together and solving problems together, we often find parties who are uh, not exactly 
appearing flexible and ready to solve problems. Uh, and there does still seem to be, in many of the rooms we go into, a sort of entrenched mindset. What do you think we can do to help uh, parties who don't have that mindset to, to think about bargaining differently? The, well, you know this as well as I do. Uh, when a, a mediator comes in the first day, neither side trusts the mediator. So you got to earn the trust uh, of both sides. And that just takes talking, that takes time, and that takes being true to your work. Uh, and whenever you get the trust, then you can start to open up facts and give them solutions. Give them examples uh, where it's worked. Give them examples of other industries that have had the same type of seemingly intractable problems that were solved whenever people put their thinking cap on. Uh, and then you work through problems. That doesn't mean that it's always going to happen. And here's some of the obstacles. Uh, frequently, and this happens on both sides. You send somebody to the table that has no authority whatsoever except to say no. Uh, you can talk to them till you're blue in the face, and trust me, I ain't going to change because they can't see. So you have to find out, of course, where the decision makers are. And then you work your way to the decision makers, bring them together, and then start talking to the decision makers uh, in, in the process. Uh, when you do that, then, and people are looking at each other face to face, it's a, a whole lot easier to build a relationship. When you have a CEO that is in New York and he's sending down edicts to a mine in uh, Southern Virginia, it's easy as hell for that employer to say, hell no, don't give him anything, no, 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 no. Well, you're gonna look him in the eyes. But whenever you're there, you're looking at each other, you're talking and saying, this is my life, this is your company. We either both win or we both lose. But we ought to be doing something different here. It gets a little more personal and a little easier to make people change and become reasonable. Because I think, by and large, most people don't want to be deemed as unreasonable or ideological, I mean, just ideologues. I think they want to be viewed as practical people that are problem solvers. And when you can put that hat on them and, you know, I've seen people, Bill Ussery was perhaps, uh, well, Bill Ussery knew more about, knows more about collective bargaining than 99% of us have, for, he forgot more than we'll ever know. Uh, and, and I've seen him be able to do that, to uh, bring you into his chair. Uh, and that's what a skilled mediator does, and you do it by building trust, having the facts, don't hype, don't oversell, and don't under-deliver. By all means, don't <laughs> under-deliver. <laughs> For the um, younger people in the room, Bill Ussery was a former uh, fabulous, incredible uh, labor, just all-around labor person who was the director of the Federal Mediation Service and also Secretary of Labor and, and a machinist union. Under Jerry Ford, by the yes, way. Yes, I know. Appointed by Jerry Ford. Exactly. So uh, it's not just because you mentioned ideologues and ideologies that I come to this question. We've been talking about the kind of uh, micro level of what you can do to change the discussion at the table. Um, we've been talking for two days about labor and management parties who have really been able to break the log jams, who've found ways uh, to be transparent, just like you said, uh, to be truthful and to be open and respectful. Uh, and to build the trust. It's not exactly the climate we're living in in uh, our country right now, and certainly not in Washington, D.C., where you and I both uh, work. So what do you think we can do, uh, what do you think labor can do to help break this uh, sort of macro-level logjam we have uh, in our political system? I, I really believe that it's, it's in the process of happening. The, the log jam is starting to disintegrate. I, it started probably two or three years ago when workers started getting fed up. And you're seeing the byproduct. And people are so angry and frustrated, they either went to, to Bernie or, or they went to um, uh, Trump uh, in the process. It's hard for me to say that guy's name, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> forgive me for being partisan, but I'm partisan on that. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> so, uh, you know, and they're saying, look, none of you were listening to me. You know, Democrats weren't listening, Republicans weren't listening, so we're going to blow up the system and we're going to start it all over. Uh, and, and you're starting to see people saying, wait a second, we have to listen. Now, think about this. Uh, four years ago, the post office, the Republican platform had a plank in the, their, their platform to privatize Social Security, and the Democrats were silent. This election platform, the Republicans are silent and the Democrats are talking about expanding the post office to do post office banking and seven days delivery. They were trying to get rid of six days, now they're talking about seven day delivery. That's a change. And that's a change because working people have started demanding things and saying, the economy isn't working for us. The rules need to be rewritten, and we are going to participate in the rewriting process. And here's the danger if we don't. I just saw a startling figure. Almost 20% of America's uh, youth, under, people under 25, believe that democracy is not a good form of government. that things could get done better with an authoritarian head. Now, until the authoritarian head decides that he or she isn't gonna be friendly anymore, right? Uh, but, but that's the danger if a system doesn't work for the vast majority of people. And so they're standing up. You're seeing the fight for 15. That's a whole sector of workers saying enough. We work hard. You know, we work hard. We need to have a, a decent living so that we can not just exist or be trapped in poverty, but so that we can have a living. Uh, you know, young people coming out of college with so much debt that they'll never pay it off. Uh, enough of this, the education going up all the time. And so I think that log jam is starting to break, and I think those that don't recognize it are people like uh, Mitch McConnell, who will say no just because President Obama said ask for something without judging it on its merits, I think they're going to pay a price. They're going to pay a price at the ballot box. I think they're going to pay a price uh, a as a party. And I think that you're going to see that change continue to happen at a, a rapidly level. And I know this. I know that millennials won't put up with that. They will not. Uh, they, they just view it as nonsense, uh, that you have a problem, you solve a problem, you don't walk around it or point fingers and blame everybody for the problem. And that's one of the things I love about millennials and youth. I mean, their, their unwillingness to accept what is because it has been uh, is the greatest strength that this country has and one of the greatest strengths that they bring to the table. Absolutely. All right, we'd love to invite some questions from the audience. And while people are uh, raising their hands and our mediators are coming around with the microphones, um, I will ask one more question, then we should be ready to tee up. Yesterday, we had a panel at lunchtime um, about uh, how to be a high road, really high road employers in the gig economy and how to make the new economy. Let's forget the word gig and just call it the new economy. And we had a young woman on the panel who is the CEO of a company called Farm Girl Flowers. Started it herself. She has a business model, only sells one uh, bouquet of flowers each day. She only grows locally sourced flowers from California. And um, when venture capitalists got interested in her model, they came to her and said, well, but you have to fire all your employees, make them independent contractors, and stop paying health benefits. And she said no. And so she told us yesterday, for those of you who are here, you remember, she said, well, I had to change my mindset. I needed to know that it was just gonna take me longer to succeed because I wasn't gonna change that model. She said, but it was so surprising. The venture capitalists came to me and said, let us know when you have a normal business model. She said, I do have a normal business model. They said, no, no, you have to sell. You have to have an IPO within five years and sell out and, and we all have to make a lot of money. So, what do we do about that? 
Well, I think we shut down the Chicago School of Business, first of all. <laughs> uh, and I'm sorry, Jorge, that's here in Chicago, but, you know, uh, the, the, you know, the austerity program and the neoliberalism that flows out of that, and that is the grandfather, the genesis of it, uh, has been the bane of country after country, and it's failed, failed miserably time and time and time and time and time again, and people keep saying, yes, but we got to do it again. And they, they impose austerity on the people of Greece, cause them pain, and wonder why the people of Greece aren't happy. I mean, I can understand why they're not happy. So, you know, I, I think we do that, but we also encourage, and I was being slightly flippant, but not totally. Uh, you, I think millennials, because of their, their wanting to know about everything, how decisions are made, they're gonna be more likely uh, or more willing to start new businesses. And we have to be willing to encourage that, give them the opportunity and the resources to be able to do that, because some of the greatest ideas in the world that we'll ever see are gonna come out of those small shops like that. And, and a person that you just talked about, uh, who's socially conscious, who treats her employees as assets to be invested in, not costs to be cut, should get the backing of every person, every business, every worker, every, every government person in this room that hopes that she succeeds, because that's the model that this country needs more of. Okay, do we have questions? Oh, come on, you don't get a chance to have Rich Trumka here very often and not I ask I planted questions. five or six of them, and I don't know. Uh, yeah, really, where are they? Come on, we know you're all not that shy. All right. Well, I'm just. I was no, yeah. Well, you are. You are that good. Um, but I suspect there are people out there who may be feeling shy. Oh, I see a hand, hand over there. Over there. <laughs> Marty, you gotta move. I'm trying. Um, my name is Corey Cordo. I'm from SEIU 121RN. My question was, uh, for Mr. Trumka, is there an overall plan to embed labor ideas into schools, high schools, college? I represent RNs, and I see a real need in nursing schools to have some labor day or some you know, idea of labor before they go into a workforce. Because with millennials, they seem more willing to jump job from job to job instead of, I have to find a job for 20 years. So they had to take those values with them, not learn them over 15, 20 years in the shop. You know, I, I would like to tell you that we have this master plan to go to the grade schools and start off or even in preschool. Pre but the truth of the matter is, because of the fights that we're in, uh, the resources that we have, uh, that's sort of in an outer ambit. It's like people say you ought to get a television station or a radio station, and that's a great idea. I wish we could but they're in the outer ambit. We're gonna keep talking about labor, keep talking about solidarity, keep having community meetings, keep bringing progressive groups together, because when we bring progressive groups together, it makes them stronger, or all of us stronger, makes it tougher uh, for them to knock any one of us off individually, and we can all support one another more effectively, and that includes schools. Uh, you know, the, the school unions, uh, the AFT and the NEA, um, and, and a number of other unions right now are organizing adjunct professors, uh, which is a little later, uh, but we have high schools and, and even grade schools, many grade schools uh, as well organized, uh, trying to keep them trained and up to date and get labor courses infused uh, into, the, into the curriculum uh, is a little longer term. We're doing it because we're running candidates for school board that ultimately set the curriculum we're doing that in Texas, we're doing that in a number of different places. Then the curriculum gets set and we can infuse a labor part of the curriculum and a labor uh, into the curriculum and that's the way we do it. But, but us talking about it, us every day out talking about the power of solidarity, the power of collective bargaining, the power of collective action, and how we get together is the way we're gonna sell that in the long run, I believe. And, and I'll tell you one last story. Uh, my, my kid one day, he was about three years old, 
And uh, his, his grandpa bought him one of those electric Jeeps. Drive me crazy, right? They drive around in that crazy. So him and his buddy are riding around in a Jeep, and I'm on the phone talking, trying to settle a problem. And he, he pulls up in the Jeep, and he says to me, Dad, what's a union? And I look at him, I go, good question, son. So I say, get out of the Jeep. So the two of them get out of the Jeep, and I tell my son, we have a hill in the backyard. I said, push the Jeep up the hill. He grunts and he groans and he slides and he slides back. He said, I can't do it. I said, Chad, and that was his buddy. Now, both of you push the Jeep up the hill. And they struggle, but they push the Jeep up the hill. And I said, son, that's a union. People coming together to do collectively what they can't do alone, right? That's the lesson that we have to teach people in the community. People coming together to do collectively what they can't do alone. There's a question over here. A question over here, Rich. Mr. Tr Mr. Trumpka, <clears throat> coming from Wisconsin and the experiment of labor happening up in Wisconsin, uh, give us a, a snapshot of the world without collective bargaining, defunding of the NLRB, FMCS. Give us a snapshot of what a world or a nation would look like, yeah. uh, like the experiment happening in, uh, in Wisconsin right now. And, and by the way, defunding of the, N, uh, the FMCS and the NLRB is, is, has, was tried a couple of times in the past, as you will recall. Uh, they tried to defund the, the FMCS so it couldn't do its job. You know, here, here's what you'd have. Uh, take the worst uh, employers right now, take the, the greatest flat wages that you can think of, take the um, uh, benefits would be less, health care would be less, pensions would be less, respect on the job would be less, more people would be tossed aside on a regular basis, Income inequality would grow dramatically, uh, and you would have a short-term hell, and I say short-term because it couldn't last for long. Because the employer, when, when as many people got angry and frustrated as you have now, and they had no outlet, they'll make an outlet. They will make an outlet. And they will create a system that ultimately gives them some benefit. So it would be a, a, a short-term hell. Employers would suffer because training and the skilled work that we do, and most people don't know this. Here's the best kept secret in the United States right now. Other than the military, the United States labor movement educates more people every year than any organization out there any organization. So you would have less skilled training, you would have less health and safety, you would have on the job, even if you had health and safety laws, they would be less effectively enforced uh, because union people weren't on the job to do that with. So uh, it would be uh, uh, a manager's heaven or a Wall Street heaven for a few years uh, until it started going the opposite way, and then it would be a Wall Street hell uh, until equilibrium was uh, achieved again. Hi. Um, one. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi. One of the things I find really fascinating about this crisis point that we're in politically, as you mentioned, the complete polarization, uh, is how some worker issues and even some workers themselves have kind of uh, jumped onto this bandwagon of um, you know, uh, modified trade deals and nationalism and everything that, that is represented by uh, the current Republican Party and, and Donald Trump. Um, so w what is the AFL doing, if anything, to address the fact that there is this weird kind of like um, worker message from that camp? Yeah, well, it, it's a pseudo worker message. It's a, it's a joke, it's a fraud. And, and so what we did, we brought um, a couple of thousand uh, would be or want to be or could be uh, Trump supporters together. And we actually did in-depth studies with them, talked to them about everything. And uh, you, you can't go to them 
and say, you know, he's a racist, he's a bigot, he's a misogynist and xenophobic. And they'll look at you and say, I know. <laughs> no effect at all. Then you say to him, do you know he thinks your wages are too high? Really? He supports right to work, not a little bit, but 100%. Really? He thinks Carl Icahn would be a great treasury secretary. You're shitting me. <laughs> Pardon my language. <laughs> but that's the response that we got. Uh, and then he thinks outsourcing is good, and he outsources all of his products, and he talks about being against TPP, but ask him where he makes his product. His ties come from Japan, his furniture comes here, uh, his shirts come from Malaysia and Bangladesh. You're kidding me. And when you give them the facts, the economic facts, they start walking back across the bridge. Our job, as it always is, is to get our members and working folks the facts about the candidates, all the facts, and let them make a decision. Here's what I found out about working people. When they get the facts, they make the right decision every single time. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Pre President Chomka, uh, I'm Ben Toyama from Pro Hava Naval Shipyard. I'm a federal employee. And I'm just wondering, and, and we have a great partnership, and most federal agencies have uh, this partnership that have unions, but we're an open shop. And those places without unions, they can't even begin to create a partnership, working partnership in, in, in that regard. So just Wondering what you thought about the open shops and how do we resolve <clears throat> the problem of open shops in Virginia and elsewhere? Yeah. The, the, leader, the uh, literature also indicates that uh, without a union, it's tough to make a labor management cooperative program really work because they only work whenever the both parties are of relatively equal strength. And, and I like to use this uh, example. Uh, my kid came to me, he was about five years old at the time, uh, and he said, Dad, uh, I want a go-kart. <laughs> I looked at him and said, no, <laughs> not a chance. And he stomps off. My wife comes to me and said, I want a new car. I said, let's sit down and talk about this. <laughs> you know, the, the difference was my wife and I, and I'm going to be generous to me when I say we're of equal bargaining strength, but me and my kid, he had no leverage. Yeah, he didn't have any leverage, so uh, no, get out of here, her, well, let's talk about this. You know, and that's the same thing when you don't have a union. It becomes co-option rather than cooperation. Uh, and so, and, and for longevity, it, it works better when you have an organized base and you have a union that can make sure the program is actually balanced and good for everybody. Uh, because anyone, any program like that, uh, that, that is so slanted one way that it benefits one side and not the other will not long endure. And it can only be balanced if the parties are balanced, uh, relative strength. And so. That is why collective bargaining in this country should be expanded, so that everybody can win. My experience has been uh, when we sit down with an employer uh, and we are in problem solving mode, nothing and nobody can beat us. Nothing and nobody. And I, I came out of probably the most contentious uh, adversarial in industry in the country, originally the mining industry. But I ran across the, a guy in Alabama that really wanted to have a different type of relationship. And we did. A and everybody laughed at him. The industry laughed at him. <laughs> oh, you're giving up control. That union's going to run over top. Yeah, what are you, sick? You crazy man? When he started beating them in the marketplace, because costs were going down and productivity was going up and health and safety was improved and our guys were laughing when they came out of work and having a good time. The other companies started saying, you know, Trump, maybe there is something to this labor management. Maybe we ought to talk about it. 
Uh, it worked with a couple of them that were willing to actually have a relationship, and it wasn't co-option, it, but it was cooperation. And it works because both sides want it to work, and both sides are of equal power. Without it, uh, I don't see it taken off, and I see more of the inequality that we've seen in the past. Well, with that fabulous definition of equality of bargaining power <laughs> that I will be reminding my husband of <laughs> any moment now, I want to thank you so much, President Trumka. This has been a delight. And thank you so thank much. Thank you. Can I just say one last thing? I, I, I just want to say one last thing. Uh, the oldest mediator back there and the youngest mediator, uh, I, I want you to think about the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people who are living better lives because of you and because to all the mediators in here, because of your efforts, literally millions of Americans are living better and their communities are better off because of your efforts. God bless you. Keep up the great work.